Welcome to Aquinas on Christ, a Zoom conference held in July 2020. I would like to introduce Father Simon Francis Gain, a Dominican priest who teaches fundamental and dogmatic theology at Blackfriars Oxford and is a member of the University of Oxford's Faculty of Theology and Religion. He is the author of Will There Be Free Will in Heaven, Freedom, Peca Impeccability, and Beatitude, published in 2003, and Did the Savior See the Father, Christ, Salvation, and the Vision of God, published in 2015. From the 1st of September 2020, he will be the first Pink Harris Professor of Theological Anthropology and Ethics at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas, Rome, otherwise known as the Angelicum. So join me please in giving a warm welcome to Father Simon Francis Gain. reason I'm going to speak about whether the thesis of Christ's beatific vision is defensible today is because of the second of the two books that Sister Magdalene mentioned. I'll show it to you here because my publisher insists that I take every opportunity to advertise it. There it is. Did the Saviour see the Father, Christ's salvation and the vision of God? But rather than just summarize the contents of the book for you today, I thought I would say something about how and why I came to write the book, how and why I came to write it the way I did, and in that way bring out something of the defensibility of the thesis. The question I chose is a very specific one. Did the Saviour see the Father? In other words, did Jesus Christ, during his earthly lifetime, possess that same blessed knowledge of God which we Christians hope to enjoy one day in heaven? I think I originally chose the question because it seemed controversial. Different answers were given to it by Catholic theologians during the course of the 20th century. There was a massive shift in the middle of the 20th century from one answer to another. For the first half of that century, the answer of Catholic theologians was a massive yes. Up to the 1950s, this yes was uncontroversial. There was a strong consensus that Jesus possessed the beatific vision from the very first moment of his conception. He always saw his father. He always knew the divine essence, God just as he really is. Everyone agreed that this vision was continuous all the way to and including his death on the cross. However, from this yes being a matter of universal consensus among Catholic theologians, it turned very quickly in the middle of the century into a nearly equally uncontroversial no. The idea that Jesus had possessed the beatific vision was given up by pretty much all Catholic theologians somewhere in the middle decades of the century. During the 1950s and early 1960s, it was the distinguished Jesuit theologian, Karl Rahner, who really began this shift by proposing to understand Christ's vision in terms of, of an alternative to the knowledge of heaven. By 1978, Hans Urs von Balthasar could serenely state that Jesus does not see the Father in a beatific vision. When a group of theologians defended the older thesis in an issue of Doctor Communis in 1983, 
it was clear that they were swimming against the tide. The first chapter of my book is called No One Thinks That Anymore. To capture the sense of surprise you would have got at the turn of the 21st century if you had suggested that Christ had the beatific vision. No one thinks that anymore could easily have been the response. Defending Christ's beatific vision became difficult partly because it was so unfashionable and that was a challenge I wanted to meet. Back in the first half of the 20th century, theologians had generally been following Thomas Aquinas on Christ's knowledge. Aquinas thought that Christ had four kinds of knowledge, one divine and three different kinds in his human mind. Aquinas, of course, held the orthodox Catholic belief that Jesus is both divine and human as we've been hearing from Sister Magdalene this morning. This meant Christ has both divine knowledge and human knowledge. Aquinas knew that some people, the Miaphysites we mentioned in the question, he knew that some of them had held that divine knowledge was good enough for Jesus, and so he had no need for human knowledge as well. But Aquinas believed that Jesus' humanity was perfect, and that meant his human mind needed perfecting by its own proper knowledge. So Christ had to have knowledge proper to his humanity, as well as knowledge proper to his divinity. And Aquinas saw this knowledge in the human mind as threefold. Beatific knowledge, infused knowledge, and acquired knowledge. Beatific knowledge was the kind of knowledge enjoyed by the saints and angels in heaven. It was the highest sharing in the divine knowledge that intellectual creatures could have. The divinization we've been talking about. Aquinas consciously took it from the Bible, reading 1 John 3, 2, that in heaven we shall be like God because we shall see God just as he is. See him, that is, in an intellectual sense, see with the mind. Aquinas thought that we will be able to see God just as he is because God will share his own means of knowing with us, while our natural means of knowing would be totally inadequate. Our normal means of knowing are the impressions that the world makes on our minds through the senses. God, however, on Aquinas' view, knows everything through himself, through his own essence. God has no body or senses through which he comes to knowledge. He knows himself and everything else through his own spiritual being. And so Aquinas concluded that what must happen in heaven, given that the beatific vision will take place, is that God somehow floods our minds with his own being, with his own essence. And God himself becomes the means by which we know God and lots of other things in God. And this is the sharing in divine knowledge that Aquinas thought was granted to the human mind of Jesus, even while he was living an earthly life, so that his human and divine minds share the divine essence as a common means of knowledge a union on the level of knowledge that follows the hypostatic union on the level of being. To this beatific knowledge, Aquinas added to Christ's human mind a second kind of knowledge, infused knowledge, which is natural to angels, 
and a third kind, the acquired knowledge natural to human beings that begins in the bodily senses. Each of these works not through the divine essence, but via finite means of knowledge more proportioned to a created intellect. And for Aquinas, both of them contribute to the overall perfection of the human mind. Now this pattern of Christ's threefold knowledge in his human mind was the scheme that pretty much all Catholic theologians followed in the first half of the 20th century. But then this pattern was almost universally dropped, except by way of a historical reference. Dropped as referring to a way of looking at Christ's knowledge that now belonged in the past. The one part of it that all theologians hung on to was Christ's acquiring knowledge in a normal human way. But in other ways, they were departing from Aquinas quite radically, especially by denying that Jesus had the beatific vision all through his earthly life. Nor did they agree on a new picture of Christ's knowledge, apart from his acquired knowledge. Some thought about it in terms of a theory of self-consciousness. Others thought about Christ having the special kind of knowledge that the Old Testament prophets had. Others thought about Christ as having the kind of mystical knowledge attributed to some of the saints. Others thought of Christ having faith. All that they absolutely agreed on was that Christ had ordinary natural human knowledge. What they disagreed about was what kind of extraordinary or supernatural knowledge Jesus had. So apart from the Jesuit Bernard Lonergan, the great generation of theologians in the middle of the 20th century turned their back on the beatific vision as a way of explaining Jesus's extraordinary supernatural knowledge. So why did they do that? Of course, this can be looked at as part of a much bigger change in theology at the time, when Thomism was less dominant in the church. Part of the plausibility of the thesis of Christ's beatific vision may have been lent to it by the dominance of its wider theological structure, which was then lost. However, discomfort with the doctrine of Christ's beatific vision, in fact, preceded the wider collapse of neo-scholasticism, which meant that if I was to ask about the defensibility of the doctrine today, I needed to look at the reasons theologians were giving for rejecting the theory of Christ's beatific vision and whether those reasons stood up to scrutiny. And returning to wider structures for a moment, there was also the fact that it had looked as though it was not only theologians who had changed their viewpoint. It even appeared to many as though the magisterium had somehow changed its teaching too. Pius XII had explicitly taught Christ's beatific vision in two of his encyclical letters. Since the 1960s, however, church documents stopped mentioning it, at least explicitly. It's not explicitly mentioned in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, for example. Though many theologians thought the church's teaching authority had stepped back from Christ's beatific vision, just as had the theologians themselves. When St. John Paul II spoke of Christ in ways that might be interpreted in terms of the beatific vision, other theories current among theologians could be used to interpret his words in other ways. Only a handful of theologians were arguing for Christ's beatific vision. 
This was the situation when I first thought about writing my book, asking whether there was a contemporary form in which Christ's beatific vision could be defensible. But then in 2006, a church document explicitly mentioned Christ's beatific vision for the first time since Vatican II, and theologians were really surprised and taken aback. This was the CDF's notification regarding John Sabrino, which charged that Sabrino had reduced Jesus to the status of a prophet by ignoring his intimate knowledge of the Father, which in fact indicated a vision beyond that of faith, citing Pius XII's affirmation of Christ's beatific vision. So it seemed to me that the book I was working on was becoming timely, because the question of Christ's beatific vision was back on the theological agenda again. For most theologians, Christ's beatific vision seemed unthinkable. So my challenge was to assess their arguments against the thesis and explore whether Christ's beatific vision might be made thinkable again in the 21st century. Before mentioning the main arguments against Christ's beatific vision, I want to make a general point about them. There seems to be a general feeling behind the arguments against Christ's beatific knowledge, and that is that it seems to make Christ somehow unreal, somehow mythological, not really human, not down to earth. Rana was one of the first to make this point before Vatican II, and it is taken up by Sabrina. To give an idea of what it means, you know there are films where Jesus is portrayed as not quite human. He has these kind of staring eyes, as though he's not really engaged in the real world, not really part of it as though he's floating above it and somehow disengaged. I guess people do sometimes have this view of Jesus, and theologians have felt that attributing the beatific vision to Christ yields this kind of unreal Jesus. To give you an example, Father Nicholas Lombardo has recently argued that if Christ had the beatific vision, he would have been unable to take joy in anything in the world. He would have had so much joy from seeing God, the argument goes, that it would have suppressed any capacity to take joy in anything else. And that would make Jesus a bit unreal if he couldn't enjoy a good meal or the company of friends or whatever it might be. And you can find some support for this kind of view of the beatific vision in more platonic writers like such as Origen. But all this seems to me a bit like saying that if you love God, it will take you away from loving your neighbour. And yet that's the reverse of what Christians believe. Christians believe that loving God brings you to love your neighbour more. And what if the beatific vision was like that? It may give you joy in God, but perhaps taking joy in God moves you to take joy in the world God has created. My point is that I think people often have an odd view of the beatific vision and an odd view of heaven. They think of heaven in ways that suppress our humanity rather than bring our humanity to perfection, to full flourishing. And if you have a defective view of heaven as one that will make us less than human, and you project that view onto the earthly Jesus, you're going to think of the earthly Jesus as less than human. But if you have a view of heaven as something that brings us to the full perfection of our humanity, and you transfer that back onto Jesus, 
you're going to look at Jesus not as less than human, but as fully human, not as unreal, but as truly real. That's just a general orientation around the issue. What are the actual arguments that I found theologians using for the most part? One is that the beatific vision is incompatible with natural knowledge, that it would suppress the natural workings of Jesus's mind, including natural limitations like ignorance. Without these natural limitations, it is implied, Jesus wouldn't have been really human. So in response, I looked for ways in which the beatific vision doesn't create a problem for the natural workings of Christ's mind, but might enhance the natural workings of the mind, making Jesus more perfectly human. The normal perspective is that introducing the beatific vision into Christology introduces problems for the limitations that go with Christ's natural knowledge. However, I show that the introduction of the theory of Christ's beatific vision during the history of theology didn't introduce a problem for limitations in Christ's knowledge. This problem was already there because the fathers of the church came generally to want to say that Christ's knowledge was full and perfect. And yet in the Bible, there are things Christ says he doesn't know. What I try to argue is that instead of introducing this tension, Christ's beatific vision actually gives us the theological resources for solving it. Partly this is because the beatific vision is not a knowledge that is had through finite images and concepts, through reasoning and cogitation. And so it is not in competition with natural knowledge, which does take place in those ways. Precisely because it is a knowing by different means, the beatific vision can be seen as cooperative with other means of knowledge rather than in competition with them where one must win out over the other. Another prominent argument was that beatific knowledge would stop Christ suffering. Because the beatific vision is being viewed as an anaesthetic that dulls our pain. Balthasar speaks in that way. So I look into arguments about whether the beatific vision could be compatible with the psychological and physical sufferings that Christ undergoes. What I found is that those who argue that Christ's sufferings must exclude the possibility of his beatific vision, do so by engaging with inadequate models of human affectivity where there is an oversimplified picture of a soul which could only be either happy or sad. Though Jean Gallo, for example, was one of the most thorough opponents of Christ's beatific vision, on this point, he never really engaged with Aquinas' more complex picture, which allows for mixed emotions as well as a certain exceptional disengagement, as well as general engagement between sense and intellect. Critics of Christ's beatific vision who do engage with Aquinas' account, such as Jean-Pierre Torel and Paul Gongro, normally find it coherent, but unappealing. They accept as coherent the possibility that Christ could have had the beatific vision and suffering simultaneously. They just don't think that God would have done it like that. And this reveals something of immense importance to the question of whether Christ's beatific vision is defensible today. 
because what emerges as the underlying objection to Christ possessing the beatific vision is that it makes him exceptional. It makes him different from us. Even if one can make the beatific vision survive the objection that it somehow makes Christ's humanity unreal, it must still face the objection that it makes Christ an exception to the rule. In this case, to the rule that the beatific vision will always exclude negative passions or emotions. It seems to me that a fault line in contemporary Christology is how far we are willing to make Christ's humanity exceptional, or how far we want his humanity, his humanity to be qualitatively the same as, as ours. The kind of arguments I have spoken about so far have been fairly standard and prominent in the case against Christ's beatific vision, which became a settled consensus among Catholic theologians in the second half of the 20th century. When I started the book, I assumed these were going to dominate the text. But now I want to say a few things about what surprised me in the way the book developed as I went about writing it. First, there is another argument that is sometimes made against Christ's beatific vision, namely that it does not figure in the Bible. Now, you might have assumed, rightly, I think, that the Bible is going to be crucial to any question in Catholic theology about Christ's knowledge, because it is from the Bible that Catholicism takes its picture of Christ. However, at the beginning, I was very familiar with Rana's approach to questions about Christ's knowledge. In the 1950s, Rana had noted that dogmatic theologians and biblical scholars seemed to be saying very different things about Christ's knowledge. Theologians were emphasizing the perfection of Christ's knowledge, and biblical exegetes were talking about the limitations in his knowledge his growth in knowledge, and so on. And there seemed to be a tension between the two. But rather than try to resolve this tension and bring study of the Bible and dogmatic theology together, Rana tried to find a theory of Christ's knowledge in theology that would allow theologians and biblical scholars to go their own separate ways in good conscience. Rana replaced Christ's beatific vision with his own theory of Christ's immediate or direct vision, which was based on a logical deduction from the fact that Jesus was God incarnate and from Rana's philosophical theory of self-consciousness. The upshot was that the theologian could deduce this theory from dogma and philosophy, leaving it invulnerable to anything that might be found in the Bible, because the Bible had nothing to say about Christ's knowledge at this unthematized deeper level. So being familiar with Rana, I started off assuming that the Bible wasn't going to be so relevant to my book, because it was all going to be about logical arguments in dogmatic theology. However, as I worked on the book, I began to feel that separating theology and the Bible like this was not ideal, and found that the theory of Christ's beatific vision was based much more around the narrative of salvation history that we find in scripture. As I've said, 
Aquinas saw Christ needing knowledge in his human mind in order to perfect the human mind. But how did Aquinas make sense of the Christian belief that Christ's humanity was perfect? What was the point of Christ being perfect in the first place? Aquinas thought Christ had to be perfect because the whole point of Christ was to make us perfect. In other words, it's about Christ being our saviour. The biblical story of him saving us from imperfection and bringing us to perfection in heaven. On this basis, Aquinas thought it made sense for Christ to have a certain perfection so he might share it with us and bring us to perfection too. Aquinas thought of heaven in terms of, among other things, enjoying the vision of God, which perfected the mind. So he thought of Christ's human mind being perfected by this same knowledge so he could share it with us, bringing us to the beatific vision through his own beatific vision. So I discovered that Christ's beatific knowledge played a saving role in Aquinas' thought. Sometimes people have thought that Christ must have had the beatific vision just because he was God. If God becomes a human, you're automatically going to get the beatific vision in the human mind. But I don't think Aquinas thought quite that. I think Aquinas thought that, though one can see it would be fitting for an incarnate divine person to possess the beatific vision, God could nevertheless have become human without having a beatific vision. That Jesus did in fact have a beatific vision was a decision God ultimately made so that Jesus was ready to be our saviour. And this is why the title of my book is not Did Jesus Christ See the Father? It's very definitely Did the Saviour See the Father? Christ, salvation, and the vision of God. This is because how you conceive Christ's knowledge and how you conceive his role as Saviour seem to be bound up together. What happened in the middle of the 20th century was that theologians, though they may have accepted that Jesus had the beatific vision after his death, presumably so as to give us the beatific vision in heaven, no longer thought that he needed it during his earthly lifetime in order to pass it on to us. Having it after death was enough. But what Thomists in the 20th century had done was to unpack Aquinas' argument that Christ needed the beatific vision to bring us to it by looking at how Christ brings us to the life of heaven through this life, the life of faith. So theologians have asked how Christ having the beatific vision while on earth could have had a role in bringing the disciples to faith by undergirding his teaching. Christ is portrayed in the Gospels as a teacher of the kingdom of God, of divine realities. And his ability to be such an extraordinary teacher seems grounded in his personal knowing of God as his father. So Christians have traditionally argued that Jesus, because he was divine, had divine knowledge and that enabled him to teach divine things. But we should also note that in the scriptures, Jesus clearly taught in a human way, using human images, ideas, and stories. So Jesus's human teaching points to his human mind being active 
with human knowledge in the process of teaching. At this point, we start to ask questions about how Jesus's human mind was related here to the divine mind. How do we get, or how did Jesus get from divine knowledge in his divine mind to the extraordinary knowledge he has in his human mind, which he passes on to the faith of his disciples? There are various ways theologians have gone about speculating on the relationship between Jesus's human and divine minds. And contemporary philosophical theology has looked at this in terms of Freudian psychology, information technology, and supposed parallels in science fiction, such as a superhuman invader from outer space taking over the mind of a human person. But what I suggest in my book is not so much to look for analogies from elsewhere, whether the psychology of a divided mind or whatever it might be, but to look for an explanation of the relationship between Christ's human and divine minds in terms of what Catholic theological methodology calls the analogy of faith, where one item of belief is explored in the light of another item of belief. In this case, looking at the knowledge of the earthly Jesus in the light of the eschatological knowledge the saints enjoy in heaven, and seeing in the beatific vision a way in which Christ's human mind can share in the knowledge of the divine mind, something which can help in enabling his human mind to have a role in teaching and bringing the kingdom of God to others. Part of what I wanted to do was show that the beatific vision is a plausible candidate for explaining the picture of Jesus which the Gospels give us one who teaches us humanly about divine realities. But in order to make sense of this picture of Jesus in the Gospels, we need not simply to show that Jesus had the beatific vision, but to ask how the beatific vision could serve to provide him knowledge of a kind that is communicably expressible in teaching. After all, the beatific vision is widely and rightly regarded as inexpressible knowledge of the divine essence, which itself cannot be expressed in finite categories or human language. But if this knowledge is inexpressible, how could it have helped Christ express his teaching about divine things? We should recall first that Aquinas sees knowledge of God's essence as including knowledge of God's power, of his effects, of what he creates. Knowing God, the blessed knows something of God's finite effects in God. In my book, I draw attention to the fact that Aquinas thought some of this content could be drawn from the beatific vision by any of the blessed and given finite expression in ideas and images. And some of this content could then be used analogously to teach even about God. Though Aquinas thought Christ certainly had the power to do this, he or at least many of his interpreters do not seem to think Christ actually did this since he already had a fullness of infused knowledge, he had no need to draw such things from the beatific vision. Some writers in modern times, such as Jacques Maritain, have argued that this was the very purpose of Christ's infused knowledge, that it enabled him to articulate and express what was unarticulated and unexpressed in the beatific vision. 
Myself, I do not think that this is the reason why Christ had infused knowledge. Because with the beatific vision itself, there already comes the possibility of drawing finite knowledge from it. But since there are other good reasons why Christ had infused and indeed acquired knowledge, there seems to be no reason why that knowledge cannot work together with knowledge drawn from the beatific vision to equip Christ to teach in a human way about divine things. That is exactly what we find him doing in the Gospels. Finally, something that surprised me was the extent to which faith became an important category in the book. This is because most people, though not all, who take the time to argue against Christ's beatific vision, don't think Christ had faith either. So they never mention faith very much in their arguments. Gallo, for example, in his otherwise very thorough attack on Christ's beatific vision, is caught out on this very point. Gallo wanted to deny both the beatific vision and faith in Jesus, but it is not clear that he could make this work in the details. It would seem that if Christ had supernatural knowledge beyond the ordinary, it has to involve either faith or vision. Either what he knew supernaturally was evident to him, it was seen, or it was not evident. And so he needed to believe it to have certitude about it. There are theologians who agree on this. And so if Christ has faith, he can't have vision and vice versa. This is because faith appears in scripture as conviction about what is unseen. So one may deduce that if what is known is in fact seen, there can be no role for faith. Aquinas had argued from the fact that Jesus had the beatific vision to the absence of faith in him. Jesus had everything of perfection that belongs to faith, but because he saw his father, he did not believe in him. What has now entered the debate about Christ's knowledge is this argument in reverse. And Sabrino has argued that because Christ had faith, he could not have had the beatific vision. I said earlier that there is a fault line across contemporary Christology between those who are happy to make Christ somewhat exceptional among us and those who want to make him as little of an exception as possible. I see this fault line as becoming increasingly specified by whether Christ is granted faith or vision according to a particular theology. For those like Sabrino, who want to make Christ as like us as possible, he is said to have faith, just as we do. For those who are happy to acknowledge that he had vision, there are important ways in which Christ is unlike us, with him needing vision in order to bring us to faith. That is not to say that it cannot be recognized that there is a lot to the concept of faith beyond this intellectual point, and that everything that belongs to the perfection of faith cannot be as to be attributed to the earthly Christ. Christ, after all, showed fidelity, he showed obedience, and so on but that faith is in things unseen is crucial, I believe, to the New Testament understanding of faith. And to affirm it or deny it of Christ 
specifies a contemporary fault line in Christology. In each case, I think the position is largely determined on the basis of soteriology, the theology of salvation. The question is how far Christ needs to be like us in order to save us, and how far he needs to be unlike us in order to save us. The argument of my book makes much of the fact that the New Testament never clearly says that Jesus believed or had faith. There are lots of obscure candidates, but I don't think any of them pass. One example is the debate in Pauline scholarship over whether it is our faith in Christ that justifies us or whether it is Christ's own faith that justifies us. It was by dealing with exegetical debates such as this that I found I had to argue for Christ's beatific vision. The chapter on faith thus became the pivotal moment in my argument, and that I was never expecting. Once I can rule out Jesus having faith, the beatific vision is ruled in, whatever the challenges that thesis might have to face. However, it is a bit more complicated than that. There is also the fact that scripture, while it never clearly speaks of Christ having faith, never clearly speaks of him as having the beatific vision either. And what I've done is to argue that he had the beatific vision nonetheless. So why shouldn't someone else argue that he had faith, despite the fact that scripture never mentions it? Scripture is silent about Jesus having faith and silent about him having the beatific vision. But I argue that the quality of the silences is different. I don't think it is very significant that the scriptural authors never say Christ had the beatific vision. After all, the beatific vision is only mentioned a handful of times in the whole Bible. However, faith and believing are mentioned hundreds and hundreds of times, and yet the Bible never clearly says that Jesus believed or had faith. So it seems to me that a theologian has to respect that and lean towards Jesus seeing rather than believing. Saying Jesus had faith when the scriptural authors seem either deliberately or instinctively to avoid saying that, seems to me to be theologically illegitimate. With faith such a pervasive category in the New Testament, I think we can reasonably expect that the authors would have said Jesus believed or had faith, if indeed they held that Jesus believed or had faith. But they do not. But the silence about the beatific vision does not seem to have the same kind of authority because the beatific vision was not something the New Testament authors were constantly writing about. So the fact that they do not ascribe it to Jesus does not have the same significance as the fact that they do not ascribe faith to him. It was this that, that finally shaped the argument of my book and gave it something of the feel of a probability argument built up against the background of objections to the thesis I defended, with each chapter title coming from the mouth of a putative opponent. The book divides into two parts, the first part of which deals with objections that say that Christ's beatific vision is alien to a proper understanding of our Catholic tradition. After no one thinks that anymore, chapter two is entitled, it's not in the Bible. Chapter three, it's not in the fathers. And chapter four, it's not good theology. Although I concede that it is impossible to prove from scripture that Christ had the beatific vision, because every relevant passage could be interpreted in another way, I do say that there is a picture arising from a Chalcedonian doctrinal reading of scripture 
which requires a theological explanation of the relationship between his divine and human minds, as I've already said. In the next chapter, it's not in the Father's. I argue that while one could not expect the Fathers to have treated the topic in great detail, given the historical course of the development of doctrine, there is in fact a small amount of evidence in favour of Christ's beatific vision, and nothing really in favour of an alternative theory. So in chapter 4, I lay out the beatific vision in order to show that it is a plausible way of explaining how Christ can be a human teacher of divine things. In the second half of the book, I try to show how this plausibility can move to probability and ultimately to moral theological certainty about the thesis. Each chapter of the second part represents an opponent arguing against Christ's beatific vision from something that is allegedly or definitely found in scripture. But Jesus had faith. But Jesus didn't know. But Jesus was free. And finally, but Jesus suffered. In chapter five on faith, I move from plausibility to probability by showing how silence about Jesus' faith in the New Testament weights the theologian in favour of vision, as I've already said. Once that is established, one could only go back to the thesis of Jesus' faith if one could show that at least one of the other objections against Christ's beatific vision works. In each of the remaining chapters, I show that the objections can be answered. With each objection answered, I hope to bring the faithful reader closer to certainty that possession of the beatific vision is the true theological explanation of the divine and human teacher presented to us in the Gospels. By the end of the book, I hope that the faithful reader will be convinced that the thesis is put beyond all reasonable doubt for the Catholic theologian. And that's the kind of argument I try to set out in my book. Where it leads the defensibility of Christ's beatific vision is to alleging the indefensibility of Christ having faith. But there are plenty of New Testament scholars and theologians who do want to argue that Christ had faith, and that it, that, that it's somehow implied in the New Testament, if it, although maybe not stated explicitly. And here I'm suggesting is the emerging fault line in contemporary Christology between those who say that Jesus believed and those who say he saw. So in conclusion, I think there has been a shift in what is required to defend the thesis of Christ's beatific vision, from arguing against the view that it makes Christ's humanity unreal, to arguing against the view that it makes him exceptional, to arguing against the view that Christ had faith. I hope that in my book, I've laid out one argument which a Catholic theologian can think through and so find the thesis of Christ's beatific vision not simply thinkable, but something they can be certain about. And once the theologian is certain, he can then reread scripture fruitfully, not just in a doctrinal way, but in a way that is theologically speculative and fruitful. That's everything that I could think of to say in the time available. I'm not sure how much time there is left, but... Uh, Thank you so much, Father Simon. That's wonderful. Um, yes, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, if anyone would like to ask, I don't know if, um, uh, if you have a chat there, Father Simon. I don't know if anyone sent you a chat. Otherwise, someone could send it here to me. Any questions that you want to type in? 
Um, can I ask a couple of quick questions, yeah, sister? Yeah. Um, the first one, th firstly, thank you very much, Father. That was excellent. Um, firstly, I, I was just wondering what films portray Jesus as unreal? And secondly, what does Jesus say in the Bible that he does not know? Um, there is a film by a famous Italian director that I, I, I saw it years ago, so I'm remembering it from a long time ago. There's a famous Italian director who made a film about Jesus. But I, can't, and I think that was the one that I had in mind when I said that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, about what Jesus doesn't know, I think that the principal example, I suppose, is that, uh, that the son does not know the day or hour, which he says in, in Mark 13. And it says, you know, the father knows, but uh, the son doesn't know. So that would be taken as a kind of standard example. Sometimes it's also, uh, of course, in Luke 2, Jesus advances in wisdom. And so, you know, it's often thought, well, in order to advance in wisdom, you've got to, you know, not know something wise earlier on and, and grow in it. So those would be the two examples that people are, are normally concerned with when they argue about these kind of things. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah, well, Father, mm -hmm. I would love to ask you, um, yeah? I'm not sure if uh, the person's been cut off or... Yes, maybe, maybe you're uh, on mute or something. You could try to unmute yourself. There you go. Um, okay, can yeah, you hear yeah. me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, at what stage would you think that maybe Jesus had the beatific vision? Would it have been as a baby? I mean, it's extraordinary. I've I seen absolutely no reason why Jesus could not have had it as a baby. I think that um, you, you, you have to, one of the fundamental things you have to think about the beatific vision is, of course, the Catholic Church teaches that the souls of the saints can have the, be have the beatific vision. So even before the resurrection, a soul, a separated soul, can have the beatific vision. And that makes us see quite clearly that um, you don't need a body and the things that go with the body, uh, including the way that the brain operates and so on, in order to have the beatific vision because the souls of the saints can have that without a brain or anything else. Now, sometimes people have said, for instance, um, Gerald O. Collins, uh, a, a well-known Catholic theologian who writes a lot about Christology, makes the argument that the baby Jesus couldn't have had the beatific vision because his brain wouldn't have been sufficiently developed to bear the beatific vision. So it would have to come later. Uh, but I don't think that the brain and its development is actually relevant. All that's relevant for having the beatific vision is the intellectual immaterial soul. So there's no problem, I don't think, in thinking that the baby Jesus had um, the beatific vision because the development of his brain was not relevant. Aquinas has quite extraordinary ideas about Christ in the womb, but I, I won't go into those right now because uh, I think they're, they're, they're based on a, a outmoded aspects in his theology. But what we mustn't do is imagine that the beatific vision is a kind of natural human thinking, a kind of cogitation that goes through uh, lots of different ideas and concepts. If we think of the baby Jesus doing that, then I think that we, we have made a mistake because I don't think that his brain is at that stage developed in order to do all that kind of normal human thinking. This is something that we develop naturally over time, and I expect that Jesus was exactly the same. So having the beatific vision is a kind of an, an intuitive participation in God's own single act of knowledge of himself. And I think when we remember that, it doesn't appear so silly to think that the baby Jesus had the beatific vision as it would do if we thought that the beatific vision was just like natural human knowledge. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Okay. Totally intriguing talk. Thank you so much. I, I have two questions. One's very quick. 
your book, I'm now very intrigued and would like to read it, but would you recommend it for someone that isn't very uh, knowledgeable of 20th century theologians? Or is it more aimed at kind of a modern debate about the topic? It is aimed at a more modern debate about the topic, but I think I, I've tried to do it in such a way that uh, an intelligent reader can read through it, but it might have to be something, uh, uh, maybe a slow reading, or you might have to go back and read a paragraph again. Um, I, I don't think you, anyone could read it quickly, but I think anyone here today can probably read it. I think there are some people here today who have read it. They might be able to say whether they think it's a good idea to read it or not. And you had another question. Yes, more to the topic, as you were talking about, I think it was when you spoke of the first objection about yeah. having the beatific vision being in contradiction to having a human knowledge because the two would be mutually exclusive. So I don't think that's true, but I have a very complicated reason for it, which is not the point for me to explain here. Can but you what tell me I, what you think isn't, I wasn't sure what you thought isn't true. I don't think there is a, necessarily a contradiction. I think it's okay. possible to have the two knowledges yeah. without I think that's right. yeah. each other. Yeah. But my point about beatific vision is, in my head, I always imagined that somehow eternity was necessary for it. Yeah. So that we were prevented from having it because we've kind of not in eternity anymore. Mm -hmm. So well, well is, that, is that, if that makes some sense? Yeah, I suppose if you think of eternity strictly, absolutely strictly speaking, we've never been in eternity and we never will be because eternity is strictly identical with the being of God. So in terms of strict eternity, which is absolutely having everything about your life all at once, God alone has that. Okay. What Aquinas talks about the beatific vision as a participated eternity. So it's, it, it's eternal in some respect. I mean, we use the word eternal in lots of different respects, um, sometimes even of things that are just there a long time, or maybe something that doesn't have an end, but maybe it had a beginning. We, well, we use eternal in all sorts of different ways, really. But the way Aquinas wants to use it of the beatific vision is us having a certain share in the eternity of God's knowledge. So the beatific vision as, is, as it were, a single enduring act of uh, gazing on the being of God. It's not a lot of separate acts that, that we need time for that beatific act to take place. It's, as it were, it's a participation in God's eternity. That doesn't mean that we might not have other knowledge at the same time that might be more like that where we would have time because one act might come after another and so on. So um, there might there be a way in which the saints participate in God's eternity, but another way in which time is redeemed for them. It's not quite the same as time is in, in this life, in, in, in the earthly universe, but there's a way in which you could have a sequence of acts for a saint in heaven, including a sequence of acts um, of knowledge and to that extent we can think of a kind of um, a glorified time for the saints but the beatific the act of their act of beatific vision isn't even measured by anything like that glorified time it's a sharing in God's eternity but ultimately only God has eternity perfectly okay thank I'll you one last question that someone sent me and then we'll uh, then we'll break for lunch um, it, it just says, um, please ask Father Simon whether our state is higher than Adam and Eve in terms of the beatific vision, since they did not reach it. Thank you. So, yeah. would you like to? That's right. That's that's uh, the standard way of understanding this. I think it's absolutely true. Adam and Eve weren't created with the beatific vision. I think if they'd been created in the beatific vision, they could never have fallen, because part of the beatific vision is it's so perfect for us, so perfectly happy, we can never fall from it. So um, the, the, the state, the first state of the first human beings was not the same thing as the beatific vision, 
and the beatific vision is a higher state, and I suppose had Adam and Eve not sinned, at some point God would have raised them to the state of the beatific vision. So yes, the beatific vision is for us the highest state of all. It's the highest state they can be because it's a perfect divinization and uh, the, 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 the greatest knowledge of God we can have. Thank you very much. I think if I see other questions in the chat, I can always try and answer those questions uh, at some point in the chat. Great, great. Thank you so much, Father Simon. We really appreciate you being with us. And um, I don't know what your plans are, but you're, you're always welcome to <laughs> pop in 